Alright, so we are in the ante room to the fur room or the pelt room. And this room used to hold our big sheep skull collection that used to be in shelves all around the walls. But inside these tanks here is the uh, frozen tissue collection. So uh, just about every specimen that we prepare, we preserve some form of uh, tissue for genetic research or isotopes or whatever. And so these tanks work by um, having a, a pool of liquid nitrogen in the bottom, and then there are racks inside that hold 15 boxes um, tall, and then it's in a big carousel on the top. It's a little difficult to show you because there's a lot of vapor, um, but if we opened uh, the top, you would see the tops of the racks like this. So imagine the, the hatch being like this. And so the whole thing rotates around and we use our specimen database, Arcto, to keep track of which freezer, which rack, which position in the rack, and then the identity of the box and the position within the box to find every single tube that's in here. So we have uh, like 100,000 tubes in the collection that we have to take care of, and uh, Carla is working on scanning the tubes. The tubes are all barcoded. Um, so that we can record their, their position accurately. Um, about every 10 days or so, we have to swap out these supply tanks, and these are the supply tanks that feed liquid nitrogen into the freezer. Uh, and then we also have a working freezer, a minus 80 freezer, and then we also have a, a workbench over here for uh, student workers. So we, every semester we have student workers who work on uh, tissue loans or uh, subsampling tissue for the research going on by MPC graduate students, staff, and faculty. Alright, so this is the MBZ's fur room or pelt room. And this is the, the collection of preserved skins that are too large to put in the main collection upstairs. And they uh, come from a variety of sources. Um, there's a number of exotic animals in here that we've acquired from zoos or uh, in some cases acquired from the Fish and Wildlife Service of animals that were uh, hunted or imported illegally. And so they find their way down here. Uh, we don't add to this collection very often. You can imagine in the old days, we would have prepared these ourselves in the laboratory, but now it's much more efficient to do it at a, a company that makes furs, uh, but it is very expensive. So something about the size of a raccoon might cost like $100 to tan. Um, it also requires a uh, extra attention to the pelt itself, um, salting and scraping and all that sort of thing that we don't normally do. So it's a, a really heavy burden on, uh, on the preparation staff to do that kind of work. But the material that's in here goes back to the earliest days of the museum. Uh, so for studies of changes of uh, biology over time, such as uh, isotopes um, or uh, pesticides or even um, uh, genetics of some of these animals, even though many of these large animals have very large ranges, uh, it's still interesting to have the source of DNA for studying um, changes in ranges of, of them. So one, one study that we helped out with that was uh, pretty interesting was looking at the stable isotopes in our black bear collection here, because it goes back well into the history of Yosemite National Park. And Yosemite, as many of you know, has a big problem with bears eating garbage. And uh, in the early days, uh, they were actually fed garbage as kind of a, a show that they put on. And uh, we had a graduate student come and visit the collection to look at animals that were collected in that period, and also more recently uh, from the park to see if there are efforts to keep the bears out of campgrounds and out of people's cars having a significant effect on the, on the diet. And one way to do that is by looking at the hair and the stable isotopes like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and to see if they are shifting from what you would expect in the food items of people back then over to what you would expect them to eat in the wild, like berries and grass and you know, maybe occasional small mammals.